Christopher Columbus, the man and the myth. Christopher Columbus is one of the best known personages from any period of history. Yet his life is shrouded in mystery and is the subject of sharp, often acrimonious debate. How can that be? Everyone knows that in 1492, Columbus sailed to what we now call America. And everyone agrees that the four voyages of discovery irreversibly changed the course of history. But that's just about where agreement on Columbus ends. The history of Columbus is hard to piece together and even harder to evaluate. And drawing an accurate profile of the man has been made even more difficult by the numerous myths that surround him. Was Columbus a discoverer or a conqueror? A rationalist or a mystic? A capitalist or a visionary? Was he supremely arrogant or motivated by a noble cause? Or was he just the luckiest man in history, a hard-headed sailor who stumbled across America? Or was he divinely guided? Did he inaugurate an age of progress and enlightenment? Or did he unleash destructive forces that now threaten the survival of Earth? To separate the man from the myth, we must first define the man. What made him, what he tried to do, what he actually accomplished? And this is where our troubles begin. Because Columbus, to borrow a line from Winston Churchill, is a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma. Maybe he planned it that way. Scholars, historians, and writers of varying degrees of skill and objectivity have argued that Columbus was Italian, Portuguese, Spanish, French, Scandinavian, Swiss, Greek, Catalonian, Armenian, Russian, Mallorcan, Basque, Croatian, and even Chinese. <laughs> Some say he was a Spanish Jew, or that he came from a family of conversos, Jews who converted to Catholicism. Still others say he was a French pirate in the service of René d'Anjou, or a spy for King John II of Portugal, or even an agent of a secret society guarding the descendants of Jesus. More than 250 scholarly books and articles have been written on the origins of Columbus, but no one knows for certain where Columbus was born or his date of birth. Let's stop and examine the standard biography. It has so many implausibilities. It just does not make sense starting with a rags-to-riches, wool carter to admiral story. It portrays Columbus as a barely educated lower middle class Genoese wool worker. He was so embarrassed about his humble origins that he never mentioned them. Yet he married into one of the most prestigious noble families in Portugal at a time when marriage across class lines was just not done. He mingled easily with the elites of his day dukes, ecclesiastics, nobles, and kings. And then even though he was a foreigner, he was incorporated into the Spanish nobility. Not only that, he demanded and got the extraordinary offices of admiral and viceroy. Amazingly, or curiously, he used geographic information that was known in his day to be faulty. To sail directly to a series of islands more than 4,600 miles from Spain that no one had ever been to before. And he found them, exactly where he expected to find land, except that he thought he had arrived in the Indies, or did he? Using this trajectory, wool worker to admiral, as the basis for a character analysis, biographers and critics have often concluded that Columbus was the ultimate social climber. At the very least, he was proud, greedy, and arrogant. But the evidence that supports much of the standard biography is weak. For example, the claim that Columbus was Genoese is tenuous at best. 
There is no doubt that there was a Cristoforo Colombo who was born in Genoa in 1451 and whose father was a wool carter. It is not at all clear that Colombo, the Genoese wool worker, and Cristobal Colón, as the discoverer was known in Spain, were the same person. According to Dr. Charles Merrill, a linguist at Mount St. Mary's College and a Columbus scholar, Columbus never said that he was Genoese. If the document in which Columbus established a trust for his heirs is genuine, he said so only once. He always wrote in Spanish or Latin, never in Italian, standard or dialectical, except for two short and problematic notes. He was never called Genoese or Italian by Ferdinand or Isabella, or in any official documents issued by the Castilian or Aragonese chanceries. His brother Diego was naturalized as Castilian, but wasn't called Genoese in the naturalization papers. Columbus never signed his own name and never mentioned his father or mother. In fact, as Fernando noted, he deliberately chose to leave in obscurity all that related to his birthplace and family. If he ever had to sign his name, he had a little set of hieroglyphs that he would pen that nobody could decipher. <laughs> the city of Genoa didn't seem to regard him as a citizen, and his son Fernando found no relatives there on trips he made after 1506. He signed letters and documents as the Admiral, as Christopherens, the Christ-bearer, or he used a pyramid-shaped grouping of initials. From what historians have been able to gather about the early life of a man called Cristobal Colon, many details of his life do not match Genoese documents about a Cristoforo Colombo born in 1451. Merrill continues, and his first biographers, even those who knew him or his family, were quite vague when they wrote about his early life, as if they didn't know much about it or knew more than they wanted to tell. The definitive proof that ties Colombo, the wool worker, to Cologne, the discoverer, is a document drawn up by three young men of Genoa named Colombo. Morrison said that they were the discoverer's cousins. One of the three was known by the Genoese equivalent of Johnny. According to Morrison, Johnny, like Christopher, gave up a humdrum occupation to follow the sea. In 1496, the three brothers met in a notary's office at Genoa and agreed that Johnny should go to Spain and seek out his first cousin, Don Cristoforo Colombo, Admiral of the King of Spain, each contributing one-third of the traveler's expenses. This quest for a job was highly successful. The Admiral gave Johnny command of a caravel on the third voyage to America and entrusted him with confidential matters as well. Scholars have generally accepted the authenticity of this document. For example, Felipe Fernandez Armesto, author of a respected 1991 volume called Columbus, said the document in question is one of unimpeachable authenticity. Fernandez Armesto goes on to say, this fact helps to convey a sense of the social trajectory of Columbus's life, the restrictive circle into which he was born and the clinging brood which surrounded him, the escape into worldly success, the clustering of kinsmen around the fortunate Arivistai, the role of the family provider to which he was committed by his hard-won place in the acceptance world. While the document may be authentic, it does not prove the discoverer came from Genoa. Dr. Merrill argues that the document does not establish that Johnny was related to the Admiral. Merrill says, the document doesn't say, as sometimes the summaries of it do, that they were going to see their cousin, Christopher Columbus. In fact, they didn't say anything about being any relationship to him at all. And there's no indication that Johnny ever went to Spain or that he was ever successful. It's just a supposition that Johnny, the captain of the caravel, was the same person that the document was talking about. If you want to be remembered in history, you better write down your story. <laughs> Otherwise, no one will be able to figure out who you really were. In Spain, Columbus was called Colón. That name is not the natural Spanish equivalent of the Genoese, Colombo. 
But even if the discoverer's name was Columbo, that in itself would not necessarily link him to Johnny. Columbo was a common Genoese name. Merrill says Columbo was the most common name in Genoa, like Smith or Jones in the United States. Columbo was the name they used to give to foundlings. Babies they found on doorsteps that had no names got the name Columbo. There is also a question whether the discoverer and the wool worker were born at the same time. From notarized documents, scholars have concluded that the wool worker was born in 1451. If Columbus was born in 1451, he would have been 41 when he made his first voyage of discovery. Working backwards, he would have been 33 or 34 when he arrived in Spain. By that time, he had already become an extraordinary mariner, a merchant engaged in international commerce, a bookseller, and a map maker. Although he had rudimentary education, he found time to do a good deal of reading. He also found time to marry, have a child, and hobnob with a Portuguese nobility. And he did it all without the aid of a fax machine. <laughs> it's unlikely, although perhaps not impossible, that he, do, that he did all those things before he turned 35. Especially since the Columbo, who was born in 1451, still described himself as a wool worker at age 21. There is evidence to show that Columbus was born earlier than 1451. For example, Andre Bernaldez, a friend of Columbus and a historian, said that Columbus was about 70 when he died in 1506. If that is true, Columbus was born in 1436. Now let's look at Columbus as a social climber. Much of the discussion about Columbus's character is based on his rise from the humble origins to the Spanish nobility. He married Felipa Moniz, a Portuguese noblewoman, a move that has been viewed as opportunistic. This marriage has always caused problems for historians. In the 15th century, it was unusual for a poor commoner to marry into a noble family. Most historians have tried to explain this implausible match by arguing that Felipe Moniz was able to marry a commoner because her family had fallen on hard times. As William and Carla Phillips explain, most historians present the marriage of Columbus to Felipe Moniz as a match between an ambitious but penniless young man and the impoverished daughter of a noble family down on its luck. Some historians have even suggested that Felipe was available for marriage to a commoner because she was homely. But there is no record of Philippa's physical appearance. But we do know that her family was neither disgraced nor impoverished. In fact, it had strong connections to the Portuguese court and was, in the words of one scholar, as noble as you can get. And according to William and Carla Phillips, Columbus was not a penniless commoner. They wrote, Columbus presumably had achieved some wealth and distinction of his own or he would not have been able to make such a favorable match. But if Columbus was not the son of a Genoese wool carter, did his family already have wealth and distinction? His interactions with Ferdinand and Isabella suggest that they did. Dr. Merrill says that it is unlikely that the sovereigns would have given him the privileges that they did if they had known he was from a poor family. And it is not likely that Columbus could have kept his origins from them. As Merrill points out, Ferdinand and Isabella were astute. They had a network of spies all over Europe. They could have and would have found out if he was, in fact, of a Genoese family. When the sovereigns gave Columbus a coat of arms as a newly created nobleman, they gave him the singular honor of incorporating the royal symbols of Castile and Leon on his coat of arms. They simply would not have done that if he were of humble birth. But in 1493, the sovereigns wrote Columbus a letter confirming his nobility and giving him the right to use the royal insignia along with your own arms, which you are accustomed to bear. That last phrase is in quotes. In other words, Columbus already had his own coat of arms, something no Genoese commoner would have had. Only the nobility had coats of arms. 
Scholars have tried to diminish the importance of this fact by arguing that Columbus used the coat of arms of the Genoese Weavers Guild. But that argument is unconvincing, especially since Ferdinand and Isabella authorized Columbus to use his, to use his own arms and not the arms of the guild. Specifically, that is what they wrote in the letter, to use his own arms. What's more, Columbus seemed to have a close relationship with Isabella. Although he was on the royal payroll, it was never clear just what Columbus did for the Castilian monarchy. Another secret that he never told. A bookkeeping entry by a royal accounting clerk shows that he gave money to Christopher Columbus, foreigner, who is here on Her Majesty's secret service. That did not mean that Columbus was a spy. It meant that what he was doing on behalf of the queen was a royal secret. According to Helen Nader, a prominent contributor to the Columbus Encyclopedia, Columbus was probably helping Isabella with something of paramount importance, the marriage of her daughter to the Prince of Portugal. Writes Nader, the marriage alliance with Portugal fulfilled Castilian objectives at the highest level resolving foreign policy issues of overwhelming significance. After studying archival records, Nader concluded that Columbus worked at least part-time between 1488 and 1489 on arrangements for the royal wedding. All this suggests, but does not prove, that Columbus was from one of the upper classes. There is just not quite enough information to conclusively prove anything about the origin of the discoverer of America. According to Robert Fusen, an authority on Columbus, this veil of mystery surrounding Columbus's personal background is not an accident of history. It is in large part Columbus's own doing. There is ample evidence that Columbus altered his identity, keeping many facts from his own sons. His brother Bartholomew was obviously in on the cover-up but even Bartholomew's life has been obscured. But why all this secrecy? Was the admiral of higher birth than many suppose? Historian Frederick Pohl thinks so. Others as well hint at a blood link to a royal line. The standard biography has plenty of other problems. For instance, there is no record of Columbus having been aboard the ship that supposedly took him to the Isle of Chios, or the ship that sank off the coast of Portugal and thereby facilitated his arrival at Lisbon. William and Carla Phillips have concluded that the traditional story about Columbus arriving destitute at La Rabida in 1485 is a sheer fabrication. Columbus was not poverty-stricken when he arrived in Spain. And new evidence strongly suggests that Columbus did not stay at the monastery until 1491. In fact, so much of the standard biography is now known to be wrong that Nader says studies published before 1980 are romantic fictions. Even though it is a crucial part of the standard biography, there is simply no documentary evidence to verify what Columbus said to the Talavera Committee and no primary evidence to verify that he showed them maps or charts. And finally, there is no record that the Talavera Committee ever issued a report. In fact, Foster Provost, author of Columbus, an annotated guide to the scholarship of his life and writings, does not think that Columbus's enterprise was ever rejected by any committee. But even if it was, Provost argues, that it didn't make any difference because it's clear the sovereigns were interested in Columbus's enterprise. As soon as they got finished with what they said they were going to do, namely beat the Moors, they immediately were in touch with Columbus. Just three and a half months after the fall of Granada on January 2, 1492, they issued the capitulations. And nobody ever got a better deal than Columbus. So they wanted him to go, no doubt about it. End of quote by Provost. 
Now this doesn't mean Columbus did not have to wait for years before gaining royal sponsorship. He did. And it's clear that the delays and the ridicule were painful to him. But it is also clear that the standard biography that portrays Columbus as a poor, self-seeking, Genoese social climber driven by the need to attain fame and fortune leans on shaky historical foundations. Now let's look at Columbus's enterprise and ask two questions. Where was Columbus planning to go? The standard answer is the Indies. The second question, and did Columbus believe that he actually had sailed to the Indies? At first glance, evidence seems overwhelming that he did. This includes numerous references in his letters and log to the Indies, the Great Khan, Japan, and the fabled treasures of the East. In addition, on his second voyage, he made all the members of his crew sign a document confirming that they had been to the Indies. And most historians believe that Columbus died thinking he had reached the Indies. There's an anonymous quote which sums up this position. When he started out, he didn't know where he was going. When he got there, he didn't know where he was. And when he got back, he didn't know where he had been. <laughs> Highly unlikely. But there's also persuasive evidence that Columbus did indeed know where he was going and that it was not the Indies. Let's look at this evidence. First, in the capitulations and titles, the contracts Columbus signed with Ferdinand and Isabella, there is no mention of the Indies. The king and queen simply authorized Columbus to discover and acquire islands and mainlands in the Atlantic Ocean. Islands and mainlands in the Atlantic Ocean. Second, Columbus's actions strongly suggest he knew he was not in the Indies. Morrison and others who argue that Columbus thought he was headed to the Indies point out that he carried a letter of credence from Ferdinand and Isabella that could be used to introduce him to the great Khan or other oriental potentates he might meet. But when Columbus arrived in the Bahamas, he immediately went ashore and claimed the land for Ferdinand and Isabella. He carried royal flags and repeated a declaration required to make the acquisition legal. He did this in full view of the natives, without the protection of an army as if he had prior knowledge that he would not be in any danger from the forces of an Asian prince. It would have been dangerous to claim the territories of the great Khan. Yet Columbus showed no fear of claiming lands belonging to the great Khan or any other oriental ruler. Moreover, while supposedly seeking Japan or the mainland of Asia, Columbus continued to sail around claiming islands for Ferdinand and Isabella. The writings of Marco Polo depicted China and Japan as advanced, opulent societies with streets of marble and roofs of gold. Yet Columbus carried worthless trinkets with him on his voyage. Could Columbus have brought glass beads and cheap bells to trade with a great Khan? No! But that's exactly what he would bring if he was expecting to find people who were technologically inferior to the people of Europe. In fact, that's what the Portuguese had brought to Africa to barter with the natives, and Columbus knew it. There are other indications that Columbus knew he was not in Asia. He kidnapped a number of natives to bring back to show the king and queen of Spain, and he made plans to colonize the islands. For years, scholars have debated whether or not Columbus was headed for the Indies or islands and mainlands in the Atlantic. Those who think he was headed for the Indies have the upper hand in academic circles, but it's often difficult for them to defend their position. For example, Morrison wrote, Surely the reader will ask, you do not suppose that Ferdinand and Isabella were so simple as to, as to suppose that three small vessels with 90 men could sail into a harbor of Japan or China and simply take over? The answer is yes, they were as simple as that. 
That is Morrison's conclusion, that the king and queen were so simple and simple-minded that they couldn't figure this out. The truth of the matter is, they were not simple. Ferdinand and Isabella were sophisticated rulers, and Ferdinand's area of expertise was international diplomacy. Furthermore, they had just spent years trying to subdue the tiny kingdom of Granada. They knew only too well that taking over was anything but simple. A case can definitely be made that Columbus knew where he was going. All who believe that Columbus knew where he was going, please stand up. <laughs> Maybe you were there. Were you the islanders or were you his crew? <laughs> well, you were all there to welcome him, right? We know that Columbus picked a nearly perfect path to sail from Spain to the Bahamas, and that he sailed north and picked a nearly perfect path back to Europe. He also seemed to know just how far his destination was. According to Fernando, Columbus told his crew not to expect to find land until they had gone 750 leagues from the Canaries, just about the distance of the first landfall. One could argue that Columbus merely miscalculated the distance between Europe and Japan using his narrow ocean theory. But if Columbus did not think he was headed to the Indies, how did he know just where to expect land? How did he know he would find lands that he could claim? How did he know he would find people who would be delighted with trinkets? No one knows for sure. But Las Casas was certain that Columbus knew just where he was going and just what he was going to find. He wrote, Columbus was as sure as if he had already been there in person. I myself have no doubt about his certainty. He also wrote, he was as sure he would discover what he did discover and find what he did find as if he held it in a chamber under lock and key. As I mentioned earlier, Ferdinand and Isabella also suggested that Columbus had foreknowledge of the islands he discovered. In 1494 they wrote, it seems to us that all which at the beginning you told us that you could find has, for the very greater part, been true and as if you had seen it before you spoke of it to us. You're watching Elizabeth Clare Prophet, world-renowned author and founder of Summit University. Summit University is located at the beautiful Royal Teton Ranch in Park County, Montana just north of Yellowstone National Park. If you'd like more information, call 800-323-5228. That's 800-323-5228. Throughout history, Columbus has had friends and enemies. During his own life, people laughed at him and his enterprise. After he had sailed to the New World, some were jealous of his power and tried to undermine his authority. But Columbus had many powerful friends among the clergy and the nobility, a Columbus lobby, if you will, who helped him out at critical turning points in his career. Some scholars make this statement. For five centuries, Columbus has been criticized and praised. But until recently, the judgment of history has generally been positive. Columbus has been seen as a pivotal figure in history, the man who initiated the modern age. His discovery unified the world and set in motion the process of global integration. According to Charles Van Doren, author of A History of Knowledge, the discovery of America is probably the single greatest addition to human knowledge ever made by one man. The discovery of the New World transformed the Old World. Before 1492, Europe was cynical and pessimistic. But after Columbus's discovery, Europe's outlook changed. 
men began to wonder if a golden age might lie in the near future. The discovery of the new world gave a powerful impetus to the Renaissance and the Enlightenment. Columbus had a special place in the American psyche. According to William and Carla Phillips, from the very beginning of the United States as an independent nation, Americans took Columbus as one of their national heroes. 19th century Americans identified Columbus with the spirit of the frontier, with the heroism of people leaving the security of settled homes to search for a new life. They applauded his invention of bold new ideas and viewed his life as a challenge to outmoded tradition and repressive authority. They celebrated his life as the triumph of a heroic individual, standing alone and unafraid against society's ingrained prejudice. In short, Americans appropriated Columbus as a symbol of everything they admired in themselves as a nation. Yet would you know it? Today, Columbus is on trial in America. He has been accused of everything from greed and dishonesty to torture and murder, to echocide and genocide. I would like to address these charges, starting with the charge of dishonesty. Kirkpatrick Sale is the author of The Conquest of Paradise, a book highly critical of Columbus's legacy. Sale argues that Columbus is dishonest, and he builds on this assessment to attack virtually every aspect of the discoverer's life and character. Sale was the star witness at a mock trial of Christopher Columbus organized by the University of Minnesota Human Rights Center. During the mock trial, Sale testified, Columbus was not a truthful man. He cited as evidence the deception in the log on the first voyage in which he apparently kept two quite different logs to deceive the crew. According to Las Casas' abstract of the log, Columbus kept two sets of figures regarding his fleet's daily progress on the outward voyage. Columbus kept the accurate figures to himself and reported smaller figures to his men in order to allay their fears. For example, the log entry for September 10th reads, on that day and night they made 60 leagues, but he reported only 48 leagues so that the men would not be frightened if the voyage were long. Scholars have wondered if Columbus really kept two logs. William and Carla Phillips wrote, this notion of a false log passed into the mythology of Columbus and is mentioned in virtually every discussion of the 1492 voyage. Nonetheless, the false log theory does not make sense. Columbus would have had to fool not only the sailors on his own ship, but also the captains, masters, and pilots on the other two ships all of whom were presumably experienced navigators. A much more likely explanation for the dual calculations is simply that Las Casas misunderstood the diary. Instead of making a false log for the crew, Columbus first calculated the distance traveled by a method he had learned as a young mariner. Then he calculated the equivalent in terms the crew understood. The mysterious and slightly sinister false log that Las Casas postulated may be no more mysterious than that and not sinister at all. End of quote by the Phillips. Now I will address the accusation of genocide. Some of the other charges made against Columbus are complex, but not genocide. Russell Means a leader of the American Indian movement said that Columbus makes Hitler look like a juvenile delinquent. The basis for this charge is that following Columbus's voyage to the New World, the populations of the Indians dropped precipitously, and some tribes, like the Tainos, were completely wiped out. Researchers estimated the Indian population of Hispaniola to be about 8 million prior to 1492. Twenty years later, it was about 28,000. According to Sale, this is more than a decimation. It is a carnage of more than 99%, something what we must call closer to genocide. End of quote. The loss of life was a colossal tragedy. 
Indian populations in the New World, which numbered about 40 to 50 million people prior to 1492, were decimated. Within 50 years, there were only 2 to 3 million left. But it was not due to genocide. The culprits were not the Spanish or even the French or British who also colonized the New World. The real culprits were European diseases, particularly smallpox. Many more Indians died of the accidental transmission of European diseases than were deliberately killed by European swords. In short, neither Columbus nor the Spanish were engaged in the deliberate and systematic destruction of the Indians. This will come as no surprise to Sale. He notes in his book that Las Casas and other early historians tended to dwell on Spanish mistreatment of Indians as the cause of their widespread death. But, he says, a new school of scholars has begun to emphasize a quite different cause of Indian devastation, the microbes and viruses that the Spanish introduced into what epidemiologists call a virgin soil population. The consensus is now that they were the real killers of the Tainos and the Caribs in the Antilles and later of the mainland populations. Sale accused Columbus of torturing Indians. During his second visit to the New World, Columbus established a colony on Hispaniola. After a series of military battles with the Indians, he required them to pay tribute. According to Fernando, Columbus required every person over the age of 14 to provide about a thimble full of gold dust or 25 pounds of cotton every three months. If they failed to deliver, they were punished. Sale testified at the mock trial that if they didn't deliver, there were mighty penalties such as cutting off their hands or other kinds of torture. He makes the same allegation in his book, but did not note the source even though his book is profusely footnoted. There is no evidence that Columbus ever had any Indians' hands cut off or that he tortured them. Sale combined Fernando's report that the Indians were punished if they failed to deliver some gold with Las Casas' report that some Spaniards who came to the New World after Columbus cut off the hands of some Indians. But Las Casas never said that Columbus cut off the hands of the Indians. Columbus's critics have falsely characterized him as cruel, recounting his actions out of the historical context. He lived in a violent age in a nation that had what we would consider to be extreme forms of punishment. What some Spaniards did to the Indians, which Columbus was blamed for, were what Spaniards did to each other. For example, Oliver Dunn and James Kelly, the translators of the definitive edition of Columbus's log, note that if a ship's clerk or anyone else made a false entry in the ship's register, he could lose his right hand, be branded, and have his possessions confiscated. On his first voyage, Columbus seized six Indians to serve as interpreters and guides. Sale says that this act may be fairly called the birth of American slavery. Then in 1495, Columbus sent 550 Indians to Spain as slaves. His behavior is shocking by 20th century standards, but it was not out of the ordinary in his day. Columbus's contemporary critics often judge him by a moral and legal code that simply did not exist in his day. In a brief filed on behalf of Columbus during his mock trial, Priscilla Levy argued, quote, there are those who are quick to condemn Columbus for his mistreatment and enslavement of the Indians without knowing anything about his motives or reasons for initiating such actions. One may understand more fully Columbus's attitude toward slavery when realizing its commonality among nations during that period. Slavery was in full swing, practiced on a grand scale as a result of Spain's 800-year war with Islam. The Moors had dwelt in Spain since 711 AD, when they had been driven from their homes in the 1480s, a good portion of the people were sold or given into slavery. Ferdinand obtained complete possession of the persons and property of his victims. 
Slavery was a customary practice of those times, sanctioned by its ruling monarchs and the Catholic Church. End of quote by Levy. Sale is wrong when he says that Columbus initiated slavery in America. It was already being practiced by the natives when he arrived. The accusations against Columbus must be seen against the backdrop of two things. First, all that came out of the conquest of the New World was not bad. Those who see the value of progress, the evolution of political liberty, the democratization of wealth, the conquering of many common diseases, can trace it back to the forces Columbus unleashed with his discovery. Second, Columbus did not, as Sale argues, engage in a conquest of paradise. The Indian tribes of America were every bit as cruel and corrupt as the nations of Europe, and more so. According to historian Arthur Schlesinger, Jr., the Aztec, Mayan, and Incan empires were theocratic military collectivisms, quite as arrogant, cruel, and ethnocentric as the Europeans who demolished them. Far from living in harmony with nature, the Maya evidently brought about their own collapse by deforestation and other destructive agricultural practices that upset the rainforest ecosystem of Central America. Far from living in harmony with one another, the Mayan city-states appear to have been engaged in constant warfare with prisoners ritually tortured and decapitated. End of quote from Schlesinger. The Incas forcibly resettled entire populations. The Caribs practiced ritual cannibalism. The Aztecs practiced ritual sacrifice. The Aztecs did not force those they captured in war into slavery. They cut out the beating hearts of their captives in order to propitiate the sun god. Ask Schlesinger, given Aztec customs and methods, what, one wonders, would have become of the hapless inhabitants of Spain and Portugal if the Atlantic crossing had been reversed and the Aztecs or Incas had conquered Iberia. According to Schlesinger, one must hope that by the 20th century the Aztecs and the Incas would have learned to read and write and would have abandoned their commitment to torture, obsidian knives, and blood-stained pyramids. But they would most likely have preserved their collectivist cultures and their conviction that the individual had no legitimacy outside the theocratic state, and the result would have been a repressive fundamentalism comparable perhaps to that of the Ayatollah Khomeini in Iran. Aztec and Inca traditions offer little hope for the status of women, for equality before the law, for religious tolerance, for civil liberties, for human rights, and for other purposes deriving uniquely from European culture. End of quote. Sale's case against Columbus is intellectually dishonest. He distorts the facts when it suits his needs. He judges Columbus, a 15th century man, by 20th century standards. He falsely painted the Americas as paradise. But worst of all, he sees Columbus as the embodiment of all the ills of Western civilization in general and American in specific. Thus he has created a Christopher Columbus who is an arrogant, upwardly mobile, greedy capitalist who rapes the environment and crushes the little people when it suits his needs. This new mythology tells us more about how Sale, as a member of the political left and the Green Party, sees America than it does about Columbus. Sale's sins of anachronism are obvious. Why should anyone expect to find 20th century environmental sensitivity in a 15th century explorer? But Sale, like so many who have come before him, has been unable to figure Columbus out because he ignored the importance of Columbus's religious life. Scholars have had a difficult time coming to grips with Columbus's spiritual life. They knew he was extremely devoted to Jesus Christ, the Blessed Mother, and St. Francis. They recognized that he was a pious man who was close to the Franciscans and may have belonged to a Franciscan lay order. They knew that on occasion he heard celestial voices. 
The following excerpt from one of Columbus's letters tells of one of his mystical experiences. He writes, I was outside and all alone on this very dangerous coast with a high fever and greatly exhausted. There was no hope of rescue. In this state, I climbed in pain to the highest point of the ship and called in tears and trembling to your highness's mighty men of war in all the four corners of the earth for succor, but none of them answered me. At length groaning with exhaustion, I fell asleep and I heard the most merciful voice saying, O oh, fool, so slow to believe and to serve thy God, the God of all. What more did he do for Moses or for his servant David? He has had thee in his care from thy mother's womb. When he saw thee a grown man, he caused thy name to resound most greatly over the earth. He gave thee the Indies, which are so rich a part of the world and thou hast divided them according to thy desire. He gave thee the keys to the gates of the ocean, which were held with such great chains. Thou was obeyed in many lands, and thou hast won a mighty name among Christians. What more did he do for the people of Israel when he led them out of Egypt, or for David, that shepherd boy whom he made a king in Jewry? Turn thyself to him and acknowledge thy sins. His mercy is infinite. Thine old age shall not prevent thee from achieving great things, for many and vast are his domains. Abraham was more than a hundred years old when he begat Isaac, and Sarah, was she a girl? Thou criest for help, with doubt in thy heart. Ask thyself who has afflicted thee so grievously and so often, God or the world? The privileges and covenants which God giveth are not taken back by him, nor does he say to them that have served him that he meant it otherwise or that it should be taken in another sense nor does he inflict torments to show his power. Whatever he promises, he fulfills with increase, for such are his ways. Thus I have told thee what thy Creator has done for thee and for all men. He has now revealed to me some of those rewards which await thee for the many toils and dangers which thou hast tendered in the service of others. I heard all this as if in a trance, but I could find no reply to give to so sure a message, and all I could do was to weep over my transgressions. Whoever it was that had spoken ended by saying, Fear not, but have faith. All these tribulations are written upon tablets of marble, and there is reason for them. End of quote from the Admiral's Journal. Columbus collected a series of biblical and secular quotes in an unfinished book known as the Book of Prophecies. Scholars have rarely been interested in this book. It was not even translated into English in its entirety until last year. In general, they did not know what to make of it. One scholar described the book as dark and mysterious enunciations of sacred prophecy, and another the product of mental hallucinations. The book was seldom taken seriously. Del No West, the book's translator, wrote, When Columbus scholars have been confronted with a book of prophecies, they have looked the other way. According to West, 
Scholars have ignored the book because they were curiously reluctant to admit that the first American hero was influenced by prophetic ideas. As Columbus wrote in the introduction to his book of prophecies, already I pointed out that for the execution of the journey to the Indies, I was not aided by intelligence, by mathematics, or by maps. It was simply the fulfillment of what Isaiah had prophesied. According to Pauline Watts, author of Prophecy and Discovery, Columbus came to believe that he was predestined to fulfill a number of prophecies in preparation for the coming of the Antichrist and the end of the world. According to his calculations, these events were not far off. But it is not clear that Columbus actually thought the world was going to end. He may have thought that one phase of human history would come to an end and another begin. According to West, you could probably interpret Columbus either way because there is a kind of a sense of a new age dawning. The concept of the new heaven and the new earth were important to Columbus. In 1500, Columbus was arrested in Hispaniola and sent back to Spain. While still wearing his chains, he wrote a letter in which he said, referring to the newly discovered lands, of the new heaven and earth which our Lord made, as St. John writes in the Apocalypse, after he had spoken it by the mouth of Isaiah, he made me the messenger thereof and showed me where to go." End of quote from Columbus. Most scholars just have not known what to make of Columbus's claim that he was a messenger. One scholar concludes that Columbus saw himself as the Christ-bearer of the New Age. There are two themes that run through the Book of Prophecies. According to Professor Watts, the first theme is a virtual obsession with the recovery of Mount Zion, symbolized by the Holy Land. The second is Columbus's preoccupation with the final conversion of all people to Christianity. According to Watts, Columbus's ultimate goal was the recovery of Jerusalem from the, from the infidel Muslims and the liberation of the Holy Land. Columbus searched for gold to enable Ferdinand and Isabella to conquer Jerusalem. Scholars have scoffed at the idea that Spain could even contemplate attacking the powerful Ottoman Empire in order to liberate Jerusalem. But it is possible that conquering Jerusalem is not just what Columbus had in mind. In the very beginning of the Book of Prophecies, Columbus collected quotes which said that scriptures had four levels of interpretation. And then he included one example, the fourfold interpretation of the word Jerusalem. The passage reads, In a historical sense, Jerusalem is the earthly city to which pilgrims travel. Allegorically, it indicates the church in the world. Tropologically, Jerusalem is the soul of every believer. Anagogically, the word means the heavenly Jerusalem, the celestial fatherland and kingdom. What was Columbus's real purpose in recovering Jerusalem? He never spelled it out but I don't expect he expected to conquer the city of Jerusalem. I think he was speaking metaphorically, and that was his true purpose. It was to establish the new world and a place where God's plan for the new age could unfold. Thank you.
The preceding program was presented by Summit University, Box 5000, Livingston, Montana, 59047-5000. If you'd like to know more, call this number or write this address. Your free copy of Elizabeth Clare Prophet's best-selling book, The Human Aura, call this toll-free number, 1-800-323-5228. This is a limited-time offer, so call now for your free book. That's 1-800-323-5228.